it, it took me like 13 years, you know, at this point doing this stuff to kind of finally get the clues together. So uh, I feel like stuff like this, where it's it's more of a kind of session, where it's a, sort of a masterclass format, where it's, you know, a couple of hours of uh, kind of very kind of dis- dissected and, um, I guess, organized content in, in form of a masterclass or in form of a conference almost uh, experience. Like that's kind of how I look at it is, it's kind of an o- online conference form where um, I, I get to, you know, uh, basically kind of convey my background and convey kind of the things that made me who I am today and kind of the made, the, that made my work today. Uh, I think it's a lot more digestible and it's a lot more applicable uh, because, you know, in filmmaking, there's so many different routes to take. There's, uh, there's no set, set of rules, you know, you can, that I can say like, oh, I did this, that, and that, and then the people can replicate and follow. It's going to be different for everyone. Um, but, you know, in, in doing so, in explaining kind of your background and kind of all the steps that you took to, to get there and how it worked out for you, at least that kind of informs a little bit of the process. And that's, that's basically, you know, how it worked for me as well. Like in the, in the early days when I was developing uh, kind of myself as, as a director, I was always, you know, looking for those kind of nuggets of information. Please welcome today's guest, renowned director, Sava Zivkovic. Sava is famous for creating stunning films in CGI that will more than get your attention, such as his most recent film, Radiation, which tapped into the powerful real-time tool, Unreal Engine. We're also delighted to invite you along to our live workshop session with Sava, which drops this Saturday on December the 18th, where he will offer a deep dive into what CGI filmmaking is and how it can benefit you. You can find tickets to it via the links in this episode description, so please sign up and don't miss out. Let's jump right in and discover a bit more about what it's like to be a director, the power of collaboration, and so much more. Let's go. But yeah, let's do this. Um, hey everyone, welcome back to the Learn Squared podcast. And I'm super happy to announce our next guest, Sava Zivkovic. Apologies, Sava, if I've butchered your surname. No, even your full name, I'm sure I have. But thank you for joining me. That was, that was perfect, actually. So oh, uh, yeah, yeah, that was. Uh, and thanks, <laughs> thanks for, the, for the invite. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So if uh, we'll, we'll let Sava give his own little, I guess, origin story and bio in a moment. But if you're not familiar with Sava, he's a super awesome director and um i've wanted to bring him on for a while um but one of the things that definitely triggered it is because sava is hosting a our second live workshop session this saturday on december the 18th um titled cgi filmmaking so um before we begin the episode just check our um links in the description you'll see a link to the event itself and obviously to sava's work just do yourself a huge favor and first of all check out his work and then um yeah the workshop's going to be I'll, I'll let Sava definitely drop the drop the goods on what to expect for that um but yeah first i'm super excited to get a chance to speak to him today um one-on-one and also super super excited to see everybody take advantage of the knowledge is going to be dropping on december the 18th and what they'll do from it but yeah Sava, um if anybody who um is joining us today who may be not too familiar with yourself if you'd like to give a quick intro as to who you are and what you do Cool. Yeah. Um, so, like you said, my name is Sal Zhukovic. Very, very close pronunciation. Very good. Um, I'm, a, I'm a freelance director from Belgrade, Serbia, and uh, I work with a UK company called Axis Studios and uh, Hydra. And um, I mostly work in CGI game trailers and game cinematics uh, for my kind of client work. And then because of my extensive kind of CG generalist background, uh, in my free time, I am able to kind of, with the help of uh, my my team of friends, um, I'm able to kind of push out these personal projects that are very very important to me. And um, yeah, that's kind of my my overall kind of work life balance is do a little bit of a game cinematic work and then uh, do a little bit of kind of personal short film work and kind of balance between those two uh, for the most time. So um, yeah, sweet. <clears throat> Excuse me and. Um... So this Saturday, what what can uh, everyone? Uh, I want to nerd out on so many things with you, um, but yeah, let's jump <laughs> straight into the um, the workshop that we have. 
Um, yeah, what, what yeah. Can we expect I mean, I guess. Sorry. What can we expect for you on this one? Oh yeah. Well, uh, well. Ho hopefully, lots of cool stuff. Uh, but <laughs> um, I think I mean it's it's one of those things where you know, like I mean, L Learn Squared. Like this is the first time I've, I'm doing something officially with Learn Squared. Even though I've been kind of, I felt you know part of the Learn Squared Squared family for quite a while now. Uh, even back from you know the the kind of IFCC days when we, mm -hmm. when we did that title sequence and when we did the stream with Momo yep. and uh, all the kind of knowledge that I've gotten gotten out of Learn Squared's kind of courses over over the years, uh, I always felt a part of the family. But it was always we discussed it a couple of times, like should I do a course or uh, I guess you know some people expressed the interest in me doing a course as well. But the, the the course on the you know filmmaking or like how to make a short film course like to me it just it doesn't seem very you know clear or kind of feasible I guess in the in the short amount of time that the course is like you ha kind of have to cover a lot of the stuff mm -hmm. in the course if you want to go you know step by step exactly how to make a short film and that stuff is really you know it's like it, it took me like 13 years you know at this point mm -hmm. doing this stuff to kind of finally get the clues together so. Uh, I feel like stuff like this, where it's it's more of a kind of session, where it's a, sort of a masterclass format, mm -hmm. where it's you know a couple of hours of uh, kind of very kind of dis dissected and um, I guess organized content in in form of a masterclass or in mm -hmm. form of a conference almost uh, experience. Like that's kind of how I look at it. Is mm -hmm. it's kind of an online conference form where um, I, I get to you know uh, basically kind of convey my background and convey kind of the things that made me who I am today and kind of the made, that made my work today. Uh, I think it's a lot more digestible and it's a lot mm. more applicable uh, because, you know, in filmmaking, there's so many different routes to take. There's, uh, there's no set set of rules, you know, you can, that I can say like, oh, I did this, that, and that, and mm -hmm. then the people can replicate and follow. It's going to be different for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, in doing so, in explaining kind of your background and kind of all the steps that you took to to get there and how it worked out for you, at least that kind of informs a little bit of the process. And that's that's basically you know how it worked for me as well. Like in the in the early days when I was developing uh, kind of myself as as a director, I was always you know looking for those kind of nuggets of information, mm -hmm. either by you know watching. Um, commentary, director commentaries on films, yeah. or you know, watching other people's thought processes, like like Ash Torp, for example, or you know, anything like that that can give you some kind of nugget of information that um, you might align with or you might not align with, but that will kind of you know steer you in the direction that that you wanna uh, you wanna go in. So in in essence, it's it's really you know like the 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 session as I see it is is really the breakdown of kind of the process in my career and kind of how I transitioned from a CG artist uh, to a director. And that goes through kind of the early days of education, what kind of impact that had on my development, um, through the work on personal projects and how those personal projects, how each of those projects uh, impacted uh, my further development, how I met and uh, kind of expanded on the collaborations and collaborators along those projects. What are some of the key takeaways that I've learned for, from every single personal project and how that one was used to, you know, um, um, build upon in the next one. And then how all of that led into, you know, the second part, um, which is the kind of the, the professional work or the commercial work. Mm -hmm. And then kind of how I used the knowledge base, uh, from my personal work into the professional work and then vice versa, how I learned what I've learned, uh, what I've, how I've used what I've learned, uh, for example, at Axis and how I apply that knowledge back into my uh, personal films. So it's that kind of back and forth of kind of learning, basically uh, directing and developing yourself as a filmmaker, both through personal work and through commercial work. Um, and then for the last part of the of the session, we'll be taking a look at, you know, kind of a rough breakdown of uh, what are the kind of initial steps that you have to take uh, when creating a short film. And we'll be taking a look at Radiation, one of my last, uh, latest short films that I've done recently with Unreal Engine. Um, and kind of reflect on some of the benefits of of using you know real time render engines in in kind of independent filmmaking. Um, so yeah, I hope you know I hope there's a, there's a little bit of everything for everyone in the session um, where it's 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 really I I feel it's important to kind of you know paint that picture of the background because that really kind of you know 
I, I think kind of helps you understand kind of what kind of a filmmaker somebody is and how those decisions in the in the early career have helped you know shape them. So uh, yeah, that's uh, that that should be it, and um, <laughs> hopefully should be fun. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm um, I'm super like taking off my lens squared hat. I'm super excited for it. Like I'm looking forward to checking out more of all of what you just said, like your process, the way you made decisions, and all that kind of stuff. Like I'm definitely going to be there with my notepad and just taking notes along and trying to hijack as much information as possible um, from awesome. it. Um, for many reasons, obviously, firstly because you're just a dope artist, in my opinion. Um, the, my first exposure to your work was the IFCC 2017 main titles. Um, and I believe it might have been on that stream that you mentioned with Momo. And it's it's one of those where it was like, okay, this, yes, it's cool. And we're, we're kind of living in the age of where there's a lot of things that are cool anyway and eye-catching. But it went many levels beyond that. Like, it got more than my attention. It was a case of, you know, like, okay, this is cool. Mm -hmm. And what is going on here? And, you know, the, like you mentioned about decision-making, there's a lot of cool mm -hmm. visuals. Um, choices that you've made and you know like and this was me getting I guess used to this kind of realm this kind of sphere of creativity um, because my education before that was you could say a bit more the um, traditional pre YouTube age kind of like mm -hmm. educational setup um, so thinking of like you know what main titles are supposed to be which is maybe in not to put shade on anything whoever does this but more generic more like you know like hey here's the name here's a director and that's it but then mm -hmm. you see, like you mentioned, someone like Ash, who's a great example, who um, mm -hmm. who does that to a different level. And obviously yourself as well thinking, hold on, mm -hmm. this is supposed to be um, just a, you know, like a little, a little short montage of just showing who's going to be at this event. Yet mm -hmm. there's this piece of art that's the background of this. And, you know, it's like, it, it's just super awesome. I won't go into a little monologue on that. Um, but, you know, yeah, that was my first exposure to yourself. And then seeing all the stuff you've made since and subsequently and, all that kind of stuff. And obviously I met you at industry workshops a few years ago and got a chance to spend some, you know, ask, ask you some questions there as well. And it's kind of like pick apart your creative process a little bit. And again, being amazed in that sense as well, thinking, yeah, this guy's legit. The work is legit. And <laughs> um, so getting the chance to see how that is because on my creative path at this point in time, it does seem whether it's going to be <clears throat> similar to, I guess, the kind of role that you have now, or maybe working in that realm, all the roles are headed towards the kind of space that you're in right now. Um, obviously, that can always change as careers can evolve. And that's one thing I want to ask you um, straight away is, was this part of the plan where you're at right now? Or did this kind of happen by chance? Um, or was this something that you really hunted towards and found maybe some resistance along the way? Um, it was a bit of... Uh... I, I wouldn't say it was a plan, uh, for sure. Like it's 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 something I had, you know, in the back of my mind. Um, you know, like I guess growing up where I did and uh not not having kind of access to, you know, I guess like you, you never think of it as being like able to kind of, you know, learn directing or become a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. It's always just like a, some distant fantasy, you know. And um we do have institutions we are here, you know, we do have, you know, amazing, you know, faculties for, for that stuff. But uh, uh, my background was I, I studied, you know, interior and furniture design. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where I got introduced to 3D, the 3D software. Um, and once I realized that that 3D software was used for a bunch of, you know, films or visual effects, uh, that was kind of the um, almost like the tipping point where I was so blown away by it that I kind of I kind of figured out early on that. I can kind of learn filmmaking at my own pace, you know, without having to go to expensive schools mm. or, or, uh, you know, like, like go through the whole kind of filmmaking journey, because that was, that was kind of out of reach for me at the time, mm. I think. Um, and learning at your own pace, sort of that, that, that kind of vibe that you can kind of do this with animation at home um, was a little bit more accessible, I think, and a little mm. bit less um, scary in a way, you know? Where I could just kind of play and kind of explore and uh, do these things, um, but I was always, you know, I was always limited by by resources. I mean, as everybody is, you know, mm -hmm. you can't just have immediate access to characters. You can nowadays. <laughs> things have shifted <laughs> dramatically, um, but you know, like my my early uh, kind of CG work and freelance work has consisted of uh, architectural visualization and of motion design. And I've kind of combined those two in kind of these series of shorts that I've done, um, kind of focusing on architecture as the primary subject because I didn't have access to 
to people and to mm. you know actors or to 3d models you know uh, 3d character models uh, per se uh, or 3d character animation to create something more complex so you know, you know you use kind of what you have and what you what you can do which for me was architecture and motion design so i kind of combined those two um and um i guess you know when when ifcc kind of happened um you know, like we never we never did IFCC for the very reason of kind of, oh, all right, I'm going to make this film and then I'm going to expect to get a director's job out of it. I, mm-hmm. I never expected that. Uh, so at that point, I knew kind of I knew sort of in the, dire- the direction that I was developing in. I knew I didn't really care about the, you know, all that much about the CG production side of it, even mm-hmm. though I do enjoy some aspects of it. It's not really what I wanted to do. And I was always more gravitating towards kind of the creative side of the project, the kind of, you know, the, the, the idea, the story uh, of the project. Uh, that was always something that was more kind of interesting to me. And I kind of, you know, consciously kind of, you know, moved in that direction where I did this personal project so that I could focus on, on you know, on the creative aspect of it. Um, and IFCC was the first short film that I've done that I actually had, you know, the balls to credit myself as a director mm-hmm. because that's where I, that's where I, that, that was the first time that I felt uh, that because, you know, I worked with an actor there. Uh, we had a character, we had a whole story. We had uh, a whole team that worked on the project. It wasn't just myself, but it was, you know, you know, that, that's why I, I mentioned that a couple of times, you know, directing yourself is, is easy in a way because, you know what you need to do and you just do it. But directing a team, that's the, the whole, you know, that's the whole job basically as a director. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you just do it by yourself, it's kind of easy because you know the end result. And that doesn't take anything away from it, but it's, you know, like when you, when you actually get to do this for work, you're, you won't do any hands-on work. So you need to be able to utilize the team and direct the team of people and still carry out the vision that you have. So that's the, that's the kind of the whole point of it. And luckily enough, after IFCC titles, um, I've gotten a few offers, um, and uh, Access Studios was the first one that kind of brought me on board and really helped me kind of, you know, nurture and grow, uh, kind of uh, as as a filmmaker. And um, yeah, it's just it's just been a an, an awesome time since then. Um, and to your to your previous point as well, in terms of kind of that's that's just the sort of. A, it has to do a lot with timing and why IFCC was um, made the success that it had at the time. Um, and it was, it was kind of this perfect timing where there was a lot of these title sequences for festivals that I'm a huge fan of. Mm-hmm. Like you said, like title sequences, you know, they created, they evolved into an art form of, it, of its own after, you know, years. And uh, it's, it, it almost like sets the tone for the entirety of the festival as well. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's an integral part of the festival nowadays. And I was a big fan of all the kind of motion design title sequences. And uh, that, was, that was kind of my first inclination of doing that stuff. Uh, but I, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't nearly as good or as proficient as, you know, Ash or, you know, like any of the amazing mo- motion designers out there or designers out there that know how to make this stuff really well graphically. Mm. Uh, my, my expertise and my kind of strengths lay more in the filmmaking side of things. So I kind of made a conscious decision there that every title sequence that I'm going to make is going to be in the format of a short film. And that's just, you know, playing to your strengths and playing to uh, uh, just, you know, what you know. So in a way, uh, I've kind of used, I've made three title sequences at this point, and I've kind of used the opportunity to almost almost use the festivals as a kind of launch, launching platform for, platform for the short films. Mm-hmm. So in a way, you kind of have, you know, there's a title sequence, it announces the festival and the speakers, but also it gets premiered at the festival. So you get, you know, your live audience reaction. So it's almost like a, it has like a short film festival, festival premiere sort mm-hmm. of a vibe where it kind of creates this whole kind of experience around it. And um, that was, I, I felt that that was, that was my niche kind of that I found mm-hmm. it's like, all right, this is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try to do something that I'm not necessarily good at, but this is the stuff that, that definitely lies more to, you know, plays more to my strengths basically. So I kind of, I kind of wanted to, you know, focus more on the narrative kind of story-driven content uh, for all my title sequence work so far. So yeah, no, that's that's beautiful, man. And um, like with, I guess, so IFCC, the the main title for that was that. Would you say like your because you mentioned that's the first time you credited yourself as a director? Mm-hmm. Would you say that was the 
was that more so a case that that's the first time you recognized yourself as a director or did you kind of see yourself in that role already but like what was kind of stopping you from um calling yourself one I don't know. I just, I just, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I think for some reason I thought it was pretentious <laughs> of me before, you know, like, I don't know. It's, um, I, I think, I don't know. It's just, uh, there's, uh, I, I guess I felt with all the previous work that I've done because it was lacking any, any kind of real narrative and mm -hmm. any kind of character that, that kind of transports you there. I just didn't see those. I always credited, you know, animation and you know art direction or something like that right, i always right. credited that but i never credited myself as a director because it was always like these abstract pieces of you know um, architecture and motion design and yeah. stuff like that that weren't really short films i think i mean sure they are you can call them that because you know it's a you know set of images in a sequence that tell a story visually so by definition it is a short film uh but i just i, I think i had this kind of almost like rule imposed upon myself where I'm not going to do that until I actually get to work with actors and to work with a proper mm. story. Um, so that's, that's probably, you know, the reason why, and, and it also, I think it felt, I don't know, it may, may have, uh, might have to do with the imposter, the imposter syndrome and kind mm -hmm. of not feeling like, you know, like you're just starting out and you're creating these things. And I kind of felt, Oh, you know, I don't want to call myself a director because people mm -hmm. might go, well, no, you're not a director, you're a CG artist. Mm -hmm. uh, so, well, well, you know, in reality, you are when you make your first film, you, you most certainly are. So uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's just something that I felt weirdly about it. And I didn't want to, didn't want to call myself like that before. But then, you know, once I've done IFCC, that was definitely where I felt, you know, the confidence um mm. come in and kind of like all right this is this is this is real like i want to i want to do this and um luckily i was given the chance to do this uh, <laughs> over and over again ever since so um yeah it's been it's been fun well so i guess far. that's one way to kind of like um see like any validation is the, is the fact that you did something and then people were wanting to hire you for that specific thing so obviously that proved at least to yourself if you not saying you were looking for approval of any kind but you know like you mentioned it was yeah. a case of like, am, am I this or am I not this? What am I kind of thing? Um, yeah. Getting those kind of offers um, does, yeah. I guess, to show that, that, okay, you were doing the right thing. Um, yeah. But back to that thing you mentioned about people maybe saying that, oh, you know, like, they're not so specific people, but, you know, just sometimes generally the, the maybe social media or just like the commentary that are, is around, you know, this realm. Um, there's mm -hmm. always like comments and judgments and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. What was the kind of response to that particular piece? Like, did you get, any of that or was it a case of wholly positive no 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 I, I i and again like i think all of the stuff that i that i said previously about you know like somebody wanting to say that i think that i mean that's all basically self-imposed mm. that's all stuff that i was kind of battling with myself more mm -hmm. so than any external influences all of my online interactions ever since i've started luckily have been very nice and very supportive and very mm -hmm. you know um, which is sometimes in itself can be a problem, you know, like it, it can be a bit of an echo chamber as well. Mm. Uh, I think, uh, you know, as a, when you make your films, you definitely want to see the good and the bad, uh, and you want to, you want to hear varying opinions. Um, I think when those opinions, you know, like where it becomes a problem is when people start telling you, you know, oh, you could have done this differently, or you, you could have done this this way or that way. Uh, that's no longer, you know, constructive. I think that's that's kind of just them putting their own kind of spin and their own vision on it, which yeah. might not align with what you were trying to do at all. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's the kind of the dangerous part, and not just with filmmaking. I think with anything, when people kind of you know start feedback, giving feedback online for things that weren't really asking for feedback mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah, you know. Um, so yeah, it's, it it wasn't really you know like I I, I had lovely experience online uh every every time like even you know there's always you know um like with the radiation just go to jama's youtube uh it has you know the most views so far out of all the yeah. places where we posted and you'll find a plethora of different reactions to the film and i think that's beautiful like that's mm -hmm. honestly like that's gorgeous to see because like so far not so far it happened with freight first but so before um not before yeah until freight all of the films that I've done have solely lived on my Vimeo. And uh, mm -hmm. Vimeo is a very, very narrow echo, echo chamber. As much as I love it, mm -hmm. uh, the comments there tend to be, you know, the people from your own kind of circles. Yes. And it's, it doesn't reach, reach the same amount of, you know, uh, as, you, as you get on YouTube. 
Right. So for, for Freight, when we did that, that was launched on Dust as well on YouTube. Yes. And uh, it, it reached quite a bit of view, um, like views on YouTube. And that kind of brought in, you know, just a vast difference of perspectives. Yeah. And it was great because Freight was very, it was very, it was a very visual film. And I, I love the fact that people, you know, there's all these different kind of interpretations from, you know, jokes to mockery to, <laughs> you know, serious kind of analysis to, you know, everything. It, it, it kind of paints for this you know, rich viewing experience that, you know, it, it brought something different in anyone, except, you know, uh, compared to Vimeo, for example, where every comment is like, you know, awesome, great job, yeah. you know, stellar work or whatever, you know, it's, uh, it becomes a little bit, you know, kind of mono, mon monotone in a way. Mm. Uh, so, so it's, I, I think that's completely fine. You know, you just have to uh, build a little bit of a thick skin and kind of know to, you know, learn from those and to kind of, um, you know, um, yeah, it's it's a it's a valuable response, like getting an audience reaction and kind of audience response. Um, you can learn quite a bit from that. You can learn which areas worked, which areas didn't work. Um, you know, not 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 going into kind of the detail when people start giving you like precise feedback when <laughs> they themselves aren't filmmakers. Yes, um, like that's that's a little bit redundant, but still you know like you can imagine like all you need to know at this point is that this moment didn't work for this one person and then it's up to you to figure out why that moment didn't work mm. um so um yeah it's um it's a mixed bag <laughs> I, I think that's a, a, a good point you mentioned there as well because it's it's also um a one takeaway from what you just mentioned there is that it's being aware of the different kind of spaces you put your work like um the kind of feedback or just generally the kind of like i guess the viewers and the consumers like what they would be like like you mentioned vimeo i guess you could say like you mentioned it's just fellow professionals right and you yeah. know everyone's kind of on the grind they kind of know what it takes to make something great and they, they appreciate the effort and they kind of know you know a bit more yeah. behind the scene they kind of know what's gone into it without knowing what's gone into it in a kind of way um yeah. whereas yeah. like a while like i guess like films like you know generally like general release films people want to consume that it's a case of you know mm -hmm. um not not to, not to be disrespectful to them but some people will simply do not care how something is made it's a case mm -hmm. of you're putting this in front of me so you need to impress me and i'm gonna tell you if i'm impressed or not and some people yeah. don't say anything some people definitely comment um but you know it's as, as a creative i guess it's imp super important to know i guess and i'm sure you can correct me if i'm wrong on this um whether where you put something the type of feedback you're going to get so at least you can calibrate your um senses a little bit to kind of not not brace yourself but kind of you know like get the kind of data you're looking for like, like you mentioned if it's a case of okay i want to see how it works in this crowd or maybe what's it like with my fellow peers and whatnot um as yeah. opposed to being completely oblivious to it or maybe naive to it and thinking that oh in this space everyone loves it so it's, i'm, I'm going to assume that it's going to be loved there and then when it doesn't obviously that can really mess you up and throw you up yeah. and all kind of mess up things can happen yeah i mean it's it's yeah it's a, it's a weird thing I, I i still like like i don't know like i i, I kind of you know, whenever I make films, I, I yeah, I, I first and foremost, I make them for, for myself primarily. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, you know, the films that I would like to watch. And um, I, you know, I'm very privileged to be in a position where I, I'm able to make them. Um, so so it's, it's first and foremost, it's for me. And then, you know, my inner circle of friends where we kind of, you know, mm -hmm. initially look through it. And, you know, that that's the kind of the feedback that I value the most. Um, but i never i never kind of opened it up to like larger audiences or mm -hmm. like um you know like there's there's plenty to be said for like test screenings that's been done in major films mm -hmm. and uh, test screenings definitely have a part to play in 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 the film's success with with the audience but it's again like that's the thing like you have to take that with a grain of salt because mm -hmm. that's the i mean again like that's a vastly different scenario than the one that i'm in currently but uh you know with test screenings you know, all it's like I mentioned before, like all you're really w looking for there is, you know, just the reaction of the audience for specific moments of story. Mm -hmm. Did this make them laugh? Did this make them sad? Did this make them, ex you know, excited? Not, you're not looking for them to give you precise feedback of what you need to do, you know, to make it work. That's, that's up to you to, to figure out. Um, so, it, you know, in, in a lot of ways like that, that's been very similar kind of in my personal experience so far, just by, you know, I do an edit. I'm, you know, very happy with the edit with the first pass, and mm -hmm. then I show it, you know, to Milan or Is or you know 
my wife, <laughs> like that's gonna, you know, getting, getting that kind of first reaction out of them. And then, you know, you, you, you watch them watch the film, uh, you play, you play to them and you watch their reactions and you just, mm. you know, you observe kind of how they respond to it. And, uh, did this moment land for them emotionally or, or did it not? So you, you kind of, that informs kind of how you pivot from that mm -hmm. or, or do you stick to your guns and just kind of like say, no, 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 this is, you know, I like, if it didn't work for you, you know, I still believe in this moment that I'm gonna, you know, I'm still gonna push forward with it. Like it, it really, you know, no, nobody can make that decision for you, but you, you know, mm. it's, uh, it's your film, it's your vision. Um, you know, there's, there's no, there's nobody else that can make it for you basically. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and um, like with that said, of all the films you've made so far, um, have you stuck to your guns at many times or do you like, is it a kind of mixed bag? Is it sometimes you have, based on a reaction they may be looking at maybe they didn't give feedback but or maybe they did and you've adjusted something uh, versus obviously me sticking to you sticking to your gun thinking no matter what anybody says it has to be mm -hmm. this way like do you are you kind of rigid with that or have you noticed that um it's not always the case or do you notice any patterns with yourself in your creative process uh, it, it varies it, it definitely varies from project to project um and from a type of project i would say as well um I'd say it was way more common in the early days than it is now. I think, you know, as you kind of grow and as you get more experience, you get more confident in decision making. So you kind of, you know, I guess like if you compare, you know, making the IFCC with, uh, you know, for example, now making uh, irradiation or even freight a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. um, it's still, you know, because IFCC was the first one and I was, you know, so new to the process of creating an actual short and previs and all that stuff. Um, it was it was much more of a kind of collaborative experience and kind of re reactionary experience to the to the opinion of the team, and uh, the you know filmmaking is is a team sport. It's mm -hmm. uh, you're only as strong as your team, and uh, you I guess it's it's an individual um, approach. Like I I personally like really believe in teamwork and and the value that you get out of your teammates um, instead of being very you know controlling and sticking to your vision again if if being controlling and sticking to your vision and not collaborating is your thing like that's absolutely fine it it really just depends on who you are as a director and how you like to work that's that's a completely valid approach um i personally you know i i, I like to work with you know friends and um, you know collaborators and lean into their areas of expertise where where you know i need their help like for example if i have milan designing something for me i'm not i'm not gonna give him feedback you know like mm -hmm. that's that's completely redundant because mm -hmm. you know there's there's the the expectation that needs to be hit in terms of the feel of the design and the kind of the basics kind of in the brief but you know the design language and everything like that's completely up to him to decide because you know who am i to give him feedback on, mm -hmm. on design um mm -hmm. so it's that kind of a thing you know like that's that's where i, I thrive the most is kind of you know working with with collaborators um, but then again, you know, like years after, like, for example, with irradiation, uh, that was so kind of crystal, cl crystal clear for me in my mind, like mm. when I started that, you know, the edit, it almost felt like effortless in a way, like how the edit kind of got assembled. Uh, mm. And it was very close, you know, from the very first version of the of the film to the last. Um, there's only a few minor tweaks and minor changes in the edit. Uh, it wasn't, you know, it was, I would say it was like up to, you know, over 90% done on the first pass in terms of, you know, shots, choices and stuff like that. And uh, editing pace, it was just kind of, you know, that last 10% fine tuning basically in the next couple of weeks. Um, so it definitely changes, I think, as you grow and mm -hmm. as you develop. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it, it also depends on your, on your personal choice of how you like to work, really. I'm glad you mentioned the topic of collaboration um because when i and this is mainly from obviously the twitch stream that you did with momo because um i believe it was yourself milan and mahalo on the stream that day i, I, I might be wrong um, i think it was just just milan and myself all oh, right actually. okay yeah, yeah, um yeah. but it was a case of like okay i got to see the director of this piece and then how it was obviously the the you know the characters and the ships and everything was, was designed and how that worked and that really spoke to me um one key takeaway from there was okay you know like this person or this team thrives of collaboration like you can clearly see that it's not just okay i need you guys to help me with this it's a case of 
let's mm-hmm. like like collaboration is a tool it's a very powerful like mm-hmm. energy source and you definitely from, from my opinion and you've definitely confirmed that what you just said as well that you mm-hmm. definitely tap into that and make the most of that and it can you can see because um from what i can see especially when i look at the credits when you finish a film like your team i guess sometimes it expanded but the core guys are still there throughout right mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. so like collaboration is that something that you just do naturally because it is clear that trust you definitely trust the people you're with and you let them shine mm-hmm. which i guess is clearly well for me it's important because um I'm, I'm sure some people can say like micromanaging things leads to results and they can definitely make a case for that but mm-hmm. for me and i think like you know other directors that i've studied and even just noticed of like people like denny Villeneuve, ridley scott like those are people who seem to do the same thing like they they definitely put trust in whether it's actors or designers or whoever they have mm-hmm. around them and say look I'm looking to do this. You do your thing, or come back to yep. what you have, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, I guess there's a multiple part question, but I, the first question I want to ask in relation to collaboration is: Does this come naturally to you? Um, probably, yeah, because it's you know, like my closest collaborators are my close friends, uh, mm-hmm. who I kind of you know um, spend the better part of my adult life with uh, young young adult maybe i should say uh, but uh it's um you know like every 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 filmmaker you know has their trusted collaborators that they mm-hmm. work with over the course of time because you know they just hit it off so you know it's if there's a you know creative synergy there there's no really there's no really a big need to change things up i think mm-hmm. um unless you know you're actively trying to ch- change things up from project to project in terms of style mm-hmm. um I think for me, you know, it was it was part of the kind of it, it did came naturally uh, because it's kind of, you know, the, the process that it kind of developed itself in was uh, the early sort of freelancing days. Uh, that was what was that roughly 2012 to 2015, 16, mm-hmm. something like that. Those are like the early freelancing days that, um, uh, you know, like uh, Milan is uh, Mihailo. Uh, Nana and her friend, like all of us, kind of work together in this mm. kind of you know co-working space. We uh, we re- we rented out an apartment actually to kind of work together in this and create this nice. co-working space uh, for us. And um, and that's where you know like we're, we're all working on our own things. Like I was doing mm. my architectural visualization at that days. Uh, you know, Milan was still kicking out design. Uh, Is wasn't doing you know music at all. Like he wow. his his background. This might be interesting to mention as well, but uh, uh, like, is the uh, is like uh, ten year old or t- ten years older than me? So he had his like old life, which I didn't know. I didn't know <laughs> back then. And in his old life, he was actually a music producer, producer for like local artists here in Belgrade, you know. And then when we met him, he completely abandoned that life, and we didn't even know that was a thing, you know. He was a graphic designer when when we met him. So while we were share, sharing that co-working space, um, he was just working as a graphic designer. And then when I made one of my first uh, shorts called Reconstruct, which is that mm-hmm. kind of architectural visualization, kind of abstract type of a film, um, I, I hired Joel Carlos, which is an amazing composer. It's, I've been a fan of his work for mm-hmm. ages, and I really wanted to work with him. And that's the first time I actually hired a composer. You know? mm-hmm. um, and, uh, and then when, when Iz saw that, uh that i was kind of you know willing to go that mile and kind of do that he basically said like well you could have asked me you know like i (laughs) i could have done this and we're like well what are you what are you talking about you know like there we didn't know he was (laughs) he had this whole life you know of doing this stuff beforehand so then he started showing us some of his old work and we're like holy shit you know like what what are you you know why are you a graphic designer when you can do this um and not to you know you know, crap on or belittle graphic designers, but it was it was something that was apparent that that like music was, was such a you know like such a big big passion of his. Yeah. You know, just just from seeing those samples that he did like back in the day. Um. So you know, it was this situation of all of us friends kind of working together. You know, chipping away on our own individual things in the same office. Um, but still, you know, on a daily basis, being like hyped and inspired about mm. all the work that was going around, uh, you know, the work from Blur Studios, we're, we're all, you know, pretty avid gamers back in the day. So every new game cinematic, we were just, you know, drooling yeah. and, and wanting to do something like that. 
Uh, so it was this kind of, you know, years of hyping each other up and kind of, you know, constantly saying, oh, we have to do something together. We have to do something together, you know, See, sitting next to Milan every day and seeing what he draws so while you're doing 3D, like you want to make that, you know, like you, you there's no way that you're not going to try and do something mm -hmm. eventually. Uh, it just took us a while <laughs> to get there. Um, so that was that was kind of, you know, that was it was the, the circumstances that we were in that were kind of, you know, the. The, the the kind of the, the creative spark and kind of what instigated that relationship and what instigated that collaboration and uh when the first one happened when we did that twitch uh loadout thing mm -hmm. with milan that's what really opened up because that's when we got in touch with take one with the motion capture studio and that's mm -hmm. when we when all the other kind of possibilities opened up uh, with the you know uh, the ease of rendering with gpu renders and mm -hmm. all that stuff that's when things really really opened up for us um so yeah, it's uh, in a way, yeah, it, it does come very natural, I think, because it's it's been, you know, I it, it's they're my closest friends, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, and it's something that we've been, you know, developing for years. So it, nice. it does feel at this point, it does feel very natural. I would say, you know, that's definitely a better way to go about it. Uh, I, I don't know any other side of it, so I I, I mm -hmm. can't comment on that. But I, I do know that people, you know reach out online and i've gotten a few offers like that myself as well but you know people reach out for collaborators online and i think that's that's a vastly different thing especially mm -hmm. when you when you try to frame it like like being this serious kind of you know professional production where it's mm -hmm. not it's a personal project without a budget you know mm -hmm. so you know getting in getting people invested in that especially people that you don't know and kind of you know expecting them to deliver that's a whole different ballpark mm -hmm. that's a different game altogether and that rarely ever works, I think, uh, as well as this stuff can work where it's, you know, time and years and kind of, you know, fresh friendship and trust kind of mm -hmm. built into the base of this. Um, I, I think it's a much, much more kind of, um, you know, um, fruitful, uh, I guess, outcome of, of, of things. So, yeah. And in relation to you, obviously, you guys literally creatively grew up together, you friends, and made things together um yeah. do you think being in close proximity were was key um obviously assuming since the pandemic you guys did a lot of stuff remotely as well um yeah. but like say a lot of people in this day and age are probably doing more things remote than ever before even if yeah. there was a pandemic or not um do you think in hindsight looking back um mm -hmm. you could achieve the same kind of things if you were doing things remotely like do you think that would be um a hindrance maybe I don't know, man. It probably would. It probably would for us specifically. And this doesn't mm -hmm. have to mean, uh, you know, anything for anyone else, because again, you know, people are vastly different. There's, you know, so many great online communities and, um, you know, online friendships and uh, Discord groups and whatnot that people are, you know, remote friends for ages. So if if you have a good thing going on, I think, you know, proximity doesn't really play, you know, that much of a factor. Um, mm -hmm if you're that type of a person, but to us, it definitely played uh, a, a massive factor. You know, I, I don't think any of this would have happened if, if we were just, you know, friends on Skype. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think it wouldn't, it wouldn't have happened. It was, I think it was key for us to be in the same room for years and, uh, you know, be constantly hyped about this and then, mm -hmm. you know, go out and, you know, get wasted and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just kind of, you know, go, you know, do the whole mile, you know, like yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. kind of, you know, the, 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 the growth, the kind of the, the personal and professional growth that we had happening at the time, the kind of, you know, uh, the hardships and the good times yes. and everything. Like, I think it's all, it's all, it's all really like, it's, it's incredibly important in building that trust and building that relationship. Um, for me personally, I think that wouldn't have worked online. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I, I think I know because like for, from the past two years we've all been nothing but bitching about this whole <laughs> remote online experience yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so yeah um yeah and um like the two specific ones you mentioned there obviously is ad milan um where you as a director now when you're thinking of like say a project and you got the vision in your head do mm -hmm. you kind of see it through their specific i guess their voices obviously milan with the way he um like might be he's got a distinct way of the way he creates and obviously the look of his mm -hmm. his, his 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 creations and obviously is his sounds um mm -hmm. you know they're definitely you can tell that it's his 
Um, and I think mm-hmm. like it's a perfect all, all those three you see yourself and the vision and everything from what I've seen like yes the films are different but I can kind of see like you know there's, there's definitely a fingerprint of everybody like everyone's DNA is still there mm-hmm. um, so like as, as a director does that ever shape you or is it more something that's kind of subliminal like you just the result is the result um, so I guess what I'm asking is like do you ever purposely make a creative choice based on their traits and any of the collaborators that you work with um, I, I think so. I mean, it, it depends. It's kind of like specifically for Freight, for example, that's a good example there. Like Freight, a lot of the story came from an inspiration of one of Milan's pieces that he did previously. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, you know, anywhere near the final thing that, that he eventually did for Freight. But, um, you know, the whole story, the idea for the story sparked from from seeing like one of his work and mm-hmm. like how we were kind of inspired by it. Um, and it's it's not just you know it's not just you know music and and design and concept art it's you know like for for IFCC and for Freight um, all three of us collaborated on the story so it's mm. it's uh, it's kind of a collaboration at, at at its finest at those kind of early stages of really kind of figuring out what the story was and you know both stories in both those films are are very kind of you know influenced by our our personal kind of feelings and struggles at the time that we made them. Um, so that was, that was, you know, that's, that's kind of the, you know, the, that was a big part of it. Um, in terms of kind of leaning into, you know, um, the expertise, I I think it's, it's definitely, you know, like whenever I work with Milan, like, you know, I'm not going to try to do something that, um, something that's so, you know, out of his scope or out of his comfort zone or out of his, not comfort zone. He likes to break his comfort zone as well, but, Mm -hmm. uh. You know the the biggest value of working with Milan is is having those like crazy unique designs and mm. you know like his very specific uh, and personal kind of shape language to things. So it's you know I'm I'm definitely gonna be you know leaning into that to get the most out of it because I know he gets the most out of enjoyment out of that. Mm. You know, so it's it's sort of you know like it has to be fun for everyone. You know when we do this stuff, uh, if I'm gonna be imposing my own vision or my own kind of specific design request on him um it's not gonna be fun for him anymore so <laughs> that kind of defeats the purpose out of it slightly um it's it's similar with is as well i mean with music did like we've we've changed approaches so many times and that's yeah. like where we do things a little bit differently every single time because there's always something new to be learned and you know like i'm i'm, I'm very passionate about the whole kind of music approach and working mm-hmm. with composers because especially for uh, specifically visually driven films like yes. Freight or IFCC, like music is one of your biggest tools, uh, absolutely biggest storytelling tools. So you really have to craft the experience with a composer. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the, the I, I really cherish that that moments. Like like we, we had so much fun kind of discovering all these different approaches. Uh, fun and frustration, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Like there's been moments mm-hmm. where, you know, we see things differently and we get into fights and it's all part of, it's all part of the process, you know, because, you know, like we're, we're all equally invested in the project. Like, mm-hmm. you know, we all created a story for Freight. So, uh, you know, he'll definitely ha- have things to say from his perspective as well. And you need to value that. Um, and uh, it's, you know, like it's, uh, yeah, I guess with, with music is a little bit, it's different every single time. I don't think we've ever, we've ever kind of started talking about, you know, specifically like referencing what he did previously, and then like maybe mm. we can do something like that here or there. I think we've done that a couple of times with with uh, scores from different films where we would say, you know, oh, this moment could feel like this and mm. it could feel like that. Uh, but then like that's some of the things that we changed. Um, excuse me. That's some of the things that we changed as well in the years of working together is kind of, you know, like when you work with a composer and when you when you work with an edit that has score from another film, mm. uh, it's sometimes, you know, like the edit kind of shapes itself around that score. So then yeah. when it when it when the time comes for the composer to come in and do the original thing, he's very much beholden to what that time score was, you yes. know, the score from the other film. Uh, both for the tempo for the cut points for like the emotions where they need to hit and sometimes that that can be you know a saving grace if a project is tight and uh, you have to have like a plan mm. but then the other times it could be a creative nightmare because all they can hear is that and they have to kind of not that they have to adhere to that but it's very difficult to get out of that you know mm. and do something different so we tried you know 
every single like <laughs> approach so far some some of the times like he made the score and then i made the edit to that some of the times i made the edit based off of a temp track and given him that and then he worked off of that or sometimes i made the edit with a temp track but then turned off the temp track and sent him just the edit so he doesn't hear the track that i used so it doesn't get messed up you know mm -hmm. so there, there's plenty of different approaches that we've done and we're still kind of figuring this stuff out again i think it's it's it varies from project to project mm -hmm. and what what each film's um kind of requires um but yeah i, was, I don't know if that answers the question no but, no it uh, definitely does like yeah. like this like, like yourself like when it comes to scores and sound design there's just that's like a it's it's a huge not just interest i love geeking out on it and for me um that can very much make or break that experience for me like the storytelling experience and some of my favorite yeah. films what i like about them as much as like the visuals might be cool and even the design and everything is the score and the sound and and even sometimes not just only that like you can tell like like say a, a good for me a good example would be like inception when um you know like nolan said to zimmer before they even started shooting i believe um mm -hmm. start thinking of the score now or even just them two as a cloud like as collaborators some of the stuff they've done and how distinct they are mm -hmm. from project to project like, I just love that kind of stuff. And then even, yeah. you know, like, say, from my impression with Spielberg and John Williams, it's a case of, like, you know, I can imagine Spielberg just like, you just do what you need to do, bro. And then he comes yeah. and delivers the goods each time. Um, and then even, like, Denny Villeneuve and um, uh, Johansson, I believe that's his, mm -hmm. uh, I'll probably put his name, but yeah, um, rest yeah. in peace. Um, but th those two, the stuff that they've done, like, for example, mm -hmm. Sicario on Arrival and all those moments where there's literally, like, you could say emptiness in terms of like perhaps dialogue and even action, but the way they build, you know, obviously, the, the, I, you know, yeah, preach to the, the choir image, with this. The, yeah. No, 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 but yeah, yeah. The, the the image itself and the, the the score is all you need to kind of create emotion and convey the feeling uh, m most of the time, really. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely you know, the stuff that I'm a fan of personally. Mm -hmm. It's I think that's the you know you can have something that's dialogue driven and that's very you know. Um, uh, hits you over the head with it and mm -hmm. kind of leaves out, you know, um, everything for the audience. Like, so you don't have, you don't have to think, but it tells mm -hmm. you, you know, the film yes. tells you what it is, or you can go with a bit more, you know, a bit more kind of reserved approach and uh, play more with kind of the, the basic tools of cinema, really, you yeah, know, yeah. like the, the, the image and the cut and uh, the composition and the performance and sound and music like you you can use all of those elements and still tell a story without mm. you know uttering a single word and that's the that's the beauty of filmmaking for me you know mm. like that's that's the stuff that i'm the most in, kind of um inspired by uh is is when you can do a story just just by the visuals i think that's the the filmmaking in its purest form really mm. is when, when it's when it's just the the visuals that are driving the story and the story is still very clear you know you're you're still getting um, all of the emotional reactions that you should out of it so um yeah and what kind of i guess films or moments or maybe even directors projects um like collaborators or whatever that that have inspired you in the in like say i'm sure there's like a, a a huge list of those um but like who would you say oh man yeah i mean it's 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 a very it's a very mixed bag of pretty much, you know, <laughs> all the usual suspects of, of the, I mean, lately, obviously I've been, you know, like, like most people on this planet, I've been blown away by Denny Villeneuve's work. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I, I've, uh, you know, I, I love all of his newer stuff, but I still think, you know, on Sandy, uh, one of his, one of his early films is still, uh, in my opinion, his best work to date, yeah. like, it's just absolutely, you know, haunting and still it sticks with you mm -hmm. um but yeah it's it, like then he has this uh, uh you know i guess the, the the minimalism to his work is something that i that i very 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 much aspire towards um roger deakins as as a cinematographer is is someone who i'm you know again constantly blown away uh, by and it's the, you know I, I i'm sure the listeners are aware of the the roger deakins podcast or the team deakins podcast uh, but if they're not, uh, that's I would definitely recommend that. It's one of the best uh, free filmmaking tools or resources out mm. there. Uh, today they have almost 200 episodes, and it's it's absolutely insane to hear all of the insight and all of the kind of thought processes that go into uh, big films like this. Um, 
but yeah, it's it's a very you know again it's a very mixed bag from mm-hmm. uh, you know uh, Danny Villeneuve to Quentin Tarantino to Bong Joon Ho to you know oh, Kira yes. Kurosawa to uh, you know like literally you know all the big filmmakers yeah. that, that are just kind of it, it just bounces around. So it's uh, it's it's a never. I'm 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 a, I'm a fan of of all of them really. Wow. Like it's uh, I can I can find something to appreciate in in most uh, in most films. So. Um, yeah, but those would be, you know, the the typical usual suspects, I'd say. Um, I definitely want to touch upon. Um, I'd love to touch upon all of them, but I don't think you have the time. But some of your yeah. your personal projects. But before we do that, um, how like is it different experience for you when you make your commercial projects? Obviously, after IFCC, you said you worked at Axis um, mm-hmm. and worked on many projects for them. And I remember speaking to you about that industry workshops because at mm-hmm. that point in time, I was still like a bit unaware of just the studios out there and like what each one does and i remember you spoke mm-hmm. glowingly about them as a studio and how they operate um mm-hmm. and obviously not just only with your project but just generally like their setup and everything as well um yeah. but yeah so i'd love to dig in a bit deeper about your um the professionals or you know the commercial side you could say because obviously yeah, your, yeah. your short films are definitely made in to a professional level um yeah, but, yeah. yeah um so like is the approach the same um, it, it, it is, uh, it is, there's a, there's a, the, the creative approach is the same. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the technical execution approach is, is the same, but, um, or similar, but it's, uh, you know, instead of five people working on it, there's, you know, almost a hundred people working on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's, a, that's a big change. Um, but in, in terms of, you know, like, I, I think that was, that was one of the things that, you know, when, when, when that when that happened when i started working with access or like one of the first days that i um came over there uh in their glasgow studio um that was like i was just you know kind of you know flabbergasted i guess by by the scale of it um i mean it's at this stage i think access is around like 500 people um and it's 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 just you know like the 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 quality level that some of the things are being done at you know, compared to your personal work is always going to be, you know, it feels like, all right, this is the next level. This mm. is the next step. Um, and it's very intimidating at first. It, it, it definitely was for me because I was, I guess, like my first experience of going there, I was I was still a little bit confused by kind of how am I able to get into this company, you know, and immediately start directing. Mm. Um, and, uh, and especially, you know, my reasoning for it was, I guess, I know you don't need specific diplomas for this industry and specific education. Mm-hmm. Uh, all that matters is your work. And I am ve- very much aware of that. But still, I think it was kind of that imposter syndrome type of thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I came in, I was I was basically saying, like, you know, like I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I wasn't, you know, educated for this stuff. Basically, mm-hmm. I learned on my own. And then every single director in the room told me, well, you know, none of us are basically, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, they are, they all learn by doing and learn by, you know, by the process of it. So that was, that was extremely, you know, helpful and reassuring. Um, and, uh, you know, just in terms of, I guess, the, the, the day-to-day stuff, I mean, it's really, you know, again, like one of the things that um, one of the directors at Access told me, what, like, you know, like one of the main reasons why they decided to hire me and kind of, you know, uh, developer re- working relationship with me uh, was the fact that they saw from out of IFCC, they saw that um, th- they basically saw that I knew how to do every step of the process mm. exactly the same as they are doing, but just on a much smaller scale. You know? mm-hmm. So I was, you know, I was able to, you know, write a story, uh, uh, record a motion capture shoot, work with actors, uh, direct the team, uh, have a strong vision in mind, and then direct that vision through the team uh into final execution basically and that's exactly what we do on the day-to-day basis at access but again the difference is being uh you're not working with five friends you're working with you know teams of Mm -hmm. up to you know from 50 to 100 people based you know based on what the type of a project it is Mm. um and it, it usually, you know, like if, if a project is secured from the start um and if you are the right director for it um um you'll just start basically you'll start off with uh, with uh, if if the script, for example, if the script is being written, uh, mm-hmm. you need to kind of you know make your visual treatment for the script, make your kind of director's approach to the script, uh, how you imagine specific things, uh, break them down into whatever you know way you want, whether that be documents or video explanations or sitting down with each individual team from the team and uh, mm-hmm. well, team from 
part of the department from the team and you know explaining your vision to them um whatever that may be you know that that's kind of you know up to you really mm. um and then you're there you know uh, the work really you know is intense in the first month where you're setting up the storyboards and where you're setting up the previs because that's the kind of the main filmmaking part of it that's mm. where you're shaping up what this project is going to be and then for the next 5 months you're basically you know building all the assets rendering animating everything and mm. and all that production stuff um so you know up until that point like you have to have your film your edit sort of locked you have to you know what you know what you're doing in advance you can't be making up you know different shots or anything you know one month before delivery because everything needs to be scheduled from the very start so the the work is very intense at the start of the project where you're kind of developing the the previs or the 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 storyboards and then towards you know middle towards the end of the project it becomes more of a kind of um part-time kind of overseeing work where, you know, the teams will be hustling uh, along the day, creating the assets, creating the environments, all of that stuff. Mm. And you'll be just popping in on a meeting or two, kind of uh, doing reviews just to review the progress on every single day in dailies. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that becomes kind of the job uh, towards the end of the project is you're just popping into reviews because there's not, there's not much, you know, there's not much hands-on work that you can do. Um, mm. there's, there's different directors that have different, uh, uh skill sets basically. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you do get to do, uh, hands-on work. For example, if a director has a really strong, uh, drawing background, um, he or she can do, you know, storyboards. Mm -hmm. Um, if a director has, you know, a good illustration background, they can do, you know, uh, concept art or illustration pieces because it's always easier, you know, maybe to do it yourself or rather than use a specific, you know, concept artist or, you know, it just depends on how anyone wants to work. Mm. Uh, to me, because I have a, a 3D background, I, I do like to be hands-on with previs. So a lot of the times I'll do my own previs and then I'll ship it to Axis so they can ingest it in their own pipeline and mm -hmm. they can kind of transport it in their own software. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really it. You know, it, it really starts, you know, uh, it's really about that kind of core idea and your core vision and treatment, mm -hmm. which is what you do at the very start. And then it's just supervising uh, the project the rest of the way. Um, it, it can vary a little bit when you're pitching on work, which mm -hmm. happens a lot. Uh, and when you're pitching, you're pitching against other directors uh, from the studio, but also sometimes against different studios as well, mm -hmm. uh, because the clients will often send um, you know briefs to, to a couple of studios. Um, so that you know that that's the kind of uh, a little bit more of a, of a, of a fun part because mm -hmm. you get to control the the creative. Sometimes you you get to write the scripts as well. Sometimes you get to you know um, not sometimes you get you get to write the scripts sometimes. But then you know most of the the time you have to create the entire you know vision and pitch deck and treatment for how this trailer how how you envision this trailer and you get to be more creatively involved with the project. Mm -hmm. Um, that was definitely, you know, the the Outriders trailer that I've done a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, that was like a t that type of a project where I got to, you know, write the whole treatment and write the whole what the sequence of the trailer is going to be, and then be very kind of, you know, creatively involved with the process. And that's still one of my favorite pieces of work that I've done at Axis. Um, and it's uh, it's it's really fun that way because again, like you just retain a little bit more ownership over it because mm -hmm. you're kind of creatively responsible for it. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of uh, I guess the couple of different situations and and how they uh, compare maybe to to some of the personal work. Um, with personal work, I guess yeah, you still get to do the same creative part at the start, but then you have to do a lot of the production yourself as well, mm. <laughs> which uh, which can be painful at times. Um, so yeah, uh, is there? Do you have a preference? Um between each one like the the personal production having a huge team versus doing the more intimate um personal projects um or do you kind of enjoy the fact that they're different approaches i i enjoy both really like mm. it's 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 what i mentioned at the start is like this kind of really nice kind of creative balance that i have now it's kind of mm. the seesaw between personal work and professional work you know i'm officially a freelance director Mm -hmm. um i mostly work with axis um and then i was recently with hydra studios as well mm -hmm. but um the, uh, the the being freelance allows me to you know uh work you know 
on a project that I want. Uh, mm. Like if you were full time, you would kind of have to, you know, do whatever comes to the studio. But when being freelance, you can really pick and choose the projects you want to work on. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean that doesn't guarantee that you'll get to work on them because you have to pitch on them most of the time. You have to pitch against other other directors, and sometimes you might not get it. Um, but at least you know it, it kind of gives you the control of choosing and you know really developing in the way that you want to develop in and do the type of work that you want to do. Mm -hmm. um, so that that really you know uh, that kind of allows me to. That means that I have sometimes I, I tend to have um, gaps between work. Mm. So I would maybe finish a trailer and then I might have a gap be before the next one starts or before the, you know, um, before I get any new work, really. Mm. Uh, and that that gap could be months. It could be, you know, like, you know, how, however, however long it could mm -hmm. be. Um, but then that means that I can I can use that time. Uh, and before I because I live here in Serbia and uh, kind of you know, work for a UK salary I, that, that buys me quite a lot of time. Mm. And I can, I can use that free time here to work on my personal films and, uh, you know, develop the, the work that I really like doing, mm. um, you know, more and more. So it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good balance, I think. It's a good, it's a good balance currently uh, because, you know, at times, like, you know, I'll, I'll do my own personal films. I'll, I'll be burnt out and sick of them by the end, you know, and working working on them mostly myself and getting them through the finish line. And then I'll be, I'll just be sick of them. I couldn't, you know, I can't work on another one after that yeah. immediately. <laughs> so then I go back to commercial work and that's a, that's almost like a vacation, you know, like, mm. oh, all right, your hands off. Now you have a big team. You can, you can relax a little bit and just do, you know, directing part. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, after a while you'll get burned off burned out from that as well just because you know the nature of the projects and sometimes you you don't necessarily have the the creative control that you would like to have maybe um or just the creative differences um because of because of the kind of the different i guess um client requ requirements or marketing requ requirements which are completely you know legitimate they're mm -hmm. you know they're, they're selling a game they have to you know have specific things, but those specific things might not align with your creative vision for it. So, mm -hmm. you know, those things can kind of butt heads at times. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that can be, you know, when you, when you kind of uh, align them a couple of projects and, you know, one after another, you, it can be, you know, quite tiring as well. So then you make, you take a break from that and you go back into personal work and then you com feel completely rejuvenated and kind of free. And there's all these, um, there's all these things with, with, doing personal stuff that uh, that I feel because studio work and especially like big budget productions as we do is uh, they're very big budget, but there's, they're also very constrained to the schedules and the timings. Mm. So even though they're big budget, like sometimes you don't have enough time or, you know, not enough, but you don't have the time that you would like to have mm. maybe to explore certain things, you know, to explore a little bit, to play a little bit in the previous mm. or in the edit or to try new shots. Like things have to be locked pretty, pretty early on so you can kind of, you know, finish the production on time because everything, again, has to adhere to schedules. When you're doing personal work, you, you're you not, you know, beholden to these rules because there's really no, you know, uh, time being imposed on you finishing this project. So you can you can explore, you can play, you can try out new things, new approaches. And that's something I really value with this, you know, personal projects that I do. I've, I've learned a bunch from them. And that, that led recently to irradiation and to using Unreal. And that really, you know, completely changed the way I approach uh, short films, mm -hmm. animated short films. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, it's a completely different ballgame now. And, um, and that's something, you know, like, uh, you, you kind of have to explore these avenues and these different uh, ways of doing things. Because I think if you, yeah, if you just stay in in a singular kind of um you know line of work or doing things it kind of becomes a little bit stale or at least it becomes for me i i, I like to mix it up every mm. every once in a while and uh i've uh, yeah I've, I've done radiation recently but there's uh at, at this moment i and i I'm, I'm gonna use this opportunity to kind of like get this you know weight off my shoulders a little bit <laughs> Uh, at this moment, I just came off a project uh, last week on a Friday, and that's been uh, so. At this moment, I have basically four completely finished uh, trailers and cinematic projects that I've directed in the past two years, in 2020 Sick. and in 2021. And um, they're all they're all I, I I love every single one of them. There's awesome work behind all of those cinematic trailers, 
and I still can't show either one of them. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna use the opportunity to just vent a little bit and just say <laughs> that that I've I've never been sitting on so many things, you know, that I can't show yet. Wow. And it's it's uh, it's you know it's been it's been good two years in terms of work, but it's also you know in a way it's frustrating not being able to show that stuff yet. Mm -hmm. um, so it's you know it, it, there's there's stuff like that, and it's uh, mm. it's my like this project that I came off of. It's basically what the 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 third project in a row at Axis uh, in those two years, uh, and uh, another one which was my production as well, but it was a commercial project. Um, so it was like four commercial projects, you know, one after another, long pro projects mm -hmm. as well. Like, and uh, at this moment, I definitely feel I need a break and I need <laughs> you know some 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 time to myself. Sometime just to myself, just to do nothing, but also yeah. sometime to, you know, do my own stuff. Even though I did irradiation in that same period, um, I, I still feel like, you know, I still need to fill up that uh, that side of, of, of the work is just kind of devote a little bit of time to myself. So, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's a long-winded way of answering that I enjoy both probably, <laughs> probably you know, not equally close to equally. I enjoy the processes equally, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the, the kind of the hands-on versus the hands-off type of work. Um, but in terms of, you know, the creative side of things, I, I mean, I, I always, I'm always going to champion my own personal work mm -hmm. because it's, you know, it's my stories. It's um, the stories with my friends and collaborators is, the, you know, working with friends. It's always, um, it's always, it always feels more creatively fulfilling. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Um, you know, there's def that, that was beautifully put and a lot of cool takeaways from that. Um, one thing I want to definitely talk about freelance a little bit. Um, but prior to that, um, obviously you mentioned, obviously you got your kind of core collaborators and your personal projects and you kind of know each other, uh, you know, like inside out, you know what to expect from each other. There's that, there's that level of like comfort and trust. Um, but at the same time, you've been working with like, she like Axis for many, many years now. Um, I guess like is there a kind of similar pattern with that where you kind of like know what to expect from a studio and the, I guess the team I'm sure the team personal changes from time to time but um, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure like it's the same kind of like I guess culture of a studio um, do you have you found that you've like kind of found some synergy and some like similar kind of patterns that you've noticed with your personal collaborators as well working with the studio like Axis? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, Axis is a wonderful place. It's um, mm. um, um, like I mean, very, very early on. It's one of one of the first visits that I've done there. Um, mm. I'm gonna mention his name publicly, and uh, he, I'm, I'm sure he won't mind. But uh, Hudson Martins, like he's the um, uh, the uh, head of effects at Axis. Uh, but he's he's someone that I you know immediately clicked with uh, mm. on my on my first visit, and uh, is is an amazing friend. And uh, you know, it's um, we 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 worked we didn't really directly collaborate I think because he runs the whole effects department so mm -hmm. he doesn't do hands on work a lot of the times he did some uh, on a couple of projects that I did but it's more about you know kind of you know that kind of friendship and that kind of interaction and the you know the creative thinking and um, the problem solving and stuff like that that mm -hmm. we had to do on a lot of the projects and how we're gonna you know if we don't have enough time or enough budget to achieve specific things, how can we kind of creatively, you know, work around them and then get the same kind of um, results or, you know, retain the, the intent of the story mm -hmm. and the intent of the direction. Um, so yeah, there's definitely, you know, there's, there's people at Axis that I, you know, absolutely, there's, I mean, mo most of the people there I absolutely love working with. Uh, there's, there's uh, you know, a lot of people there that I would call, call close friends um, mm -hmm. um, today. So um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it it depends, you know, a lot of the times because it's the, it's a big studio and there's a lot of projects going on at the same time. So mm -hmm. you don't necessarily, as a as a freelance director, you don't necessarily get to choose your team specifically. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of the, a lot of the times, teams vary from project to project, and they will be kind of pre-assigned based on the project requirements. Mm -hmm. If it's a realistic project, you'll get a you know um, lighting lead that's very you know proficient, obviously, in realistic lighting versus a stylized project, which, you know, requires a different approach. So a lot of that stuff is just handled on the studio's end because they, you know, they, they handle that stuff. I, I rarely get to, to have any, any say in that, uh, nor do I need to. Um, uh, but yeah, definitely. I mean, there's, there's, uh, 
wonderful people at Access, and I, uh, you know, miss them very much in this last few mm -hmm. years where it's been nothing but Zoom calls and Google Hangouts instead of being in a studio with all of them and just kind of, you know, working through the production together and, uh, you know, heading off to have, you know, a couple of beers later on or some dinner or whatever, you know, it's just, it's just that sense of camaraderie that you get when you're mm -hmm. there and when you're all working on it together versus this kind of, I don't know, it's just this, this whole remote thing, you know, I know it's necessary and all, but it's, it's just, uh, it's just not been the same for me. Mm. Really. Like it's, it's, it really, I think it really, yeah, you know, we've been able to do amazing work remotely as well. Um, and I, I think the quality of work didn't, didn't really suffer. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, I think those kind of moments definitely suffered a little bit for me, at least this kind of, you know, not being there with the people, not interacting, not kind of, you know, um, it, it's just not, not, not as fun, I think, as, yeah. as be, being on the spot. Um, uh, like, I mean, like for, yeah, um, I think in general, like it's just a big, it's been a big learning curve, a shock to the system for many, many people in different avenues mm -hmm. and aspects of life. Um, but at the same time, you know, like the, no pun intended, but the show must go on. Um, like yeah. what kind of things have you adopted or found yourself doing to kind of like, you know, like negate the, the negative side of that and just make sure that you keep, you know, going and making sure the stuff that you need to deliver is still getting delivered. Like, is there anything in particular that, that you've noticed you've changed or even adopted to help you with that during this kind of like lockdown thing? Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know, man. Not, I, I not necessarily, I think, mm. um, which I probably should have. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the studio, obviously, you know, when it comes to, you know, commercial work, the studio has, you know, all the fail safes and all the stuff in place to enable people to work remotely and, mm. you know, to enable the, this whole machinery to, to, to keep going. And uh, they've been amazing with that. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a studio of 500 people that's all working remotely and delivering shows like it's nothing, you know, like it, it doesn't really, um, like nothing's really changed in a way, mm -hmm. which is, uh, which is kind of, kind of crazy to, to, uh, I don't know. I just, I just never thought it would, it would be possible to do it like that, but mm -hmm. lo and behold, it is possible. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, I mean, yeah, on, on the studio side of things, like that's that's all been running very smoothly. On my internal side of things, I think it's more of a it's more of a psychological toll to me than than anything else because mm -hmm. it's uh, you know I, I'm a freelance director, so I've been I've been working remotely either way. You know, I mm -hmm. I never moved to Glasgow. I only visit Glasgow every once in a while. You know, mm -hmm. every month or two. Uh, for some, you know, specific parts of the project for like a week or two. Like it's not it's not long visits really. Um, and, uh, I, and then I work remotely from, from Belgrade and just kind of supervise from here. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of freelance directors and a lot of kind of remote directors that Access works with, uh, are also, you know, not in Glasgow. They're, they're kind of all over the, uh, all over Europe or the world. Um, and, uh, it's, it's just, uh, so for me, like initially nothing really changed when this kind of lockdown situation happened. Mm -hmm. Like I still work from home. This is I've only known freelance. I've only I've never worked in a company before. I've mm -hmm. always worked from from home. I have a very nice office setup in my home mm -hmm. that I love to spend time in. Uh, it's it's my little sanctuary, and um, you know it's 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 kind of um, it's something that I'm kind of working on improving every now and then to kind mm -hmm. of you know keep thing, keep things changing and kind of. Uh, you know, you have to create this kind of, you know, environment, your work environment, or at least to me, I think that's important to create a work environment that you feel, you feel creative in. Um, and uh, so, so, you know, really, like nothing really changed when the lockdown hit. And I thought nothing changed until the very end of the lockdown. Well, not the end, the end of 2020, where I, I realized holy shit, a lot of things changed, you know, <laughs> a lot of the things changed in my perception of it and kind of, you know, the, the psychological impact it had on me that I didn't think it had, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I was like, yeah, I'm fine. You know, things are, things are fine. I'm, I'm still, you know, still working as normal, but I just, I just didn't even realize like how much I actually missed the social part of it. Mm. Um, I think that's, that's the kind of, you know, I, I kind of, you know, in a, in a weird way, I'm, I'm sort of a, you know, I'm an extroverted introvert in a way, mm -hmm. you know, I, I like taking long, you know, seclusions in my office and not seeing anyone and just you know completely you know getting in my cave and in my little mm -hmm. bubble 
but then I like intense periods of times where I, you know, do see people and, you know, go out and, you know, do whatever. It's, uh, it's, it's really just, you know, again, a balance that works for me and kind of being rid of that for a while, uh, for a year, I just realized like, holy shit, I really, I really miss the social part of, of, uh, of working. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's just it's just in a you know it's been a big adjustment period really. And um, back to um, freelance. So um, flashing back to industry workshops. Remember, you mentioned something and um, asked you a bit more information on it. Where, mm-hmm. like again, you're talking about you work at Axis and you're a director. And um, then I mentioned like how does it work? Because obviously you're not you know some just based somewhere in the U- UK. You're obviously abroad. Um, mm-hmm. And then you mentioned that no, I just work like remotely and I work freelance, and that kind mm-hmm. of really like I had this misconception that you no, know, if you like, especially a director, you have to kind of be like physically there, or like in a lot of studio setups, they mm-hmm. want people to be in the studio. And um, obviously, mm-hmm. I'm sure that's changed because of the pandemic now. But back then, there was no pandemic, so that kind of really yeah. opened my eyes to freelance. And um, at that point, then I'm still trying to break into the industry and so on and so forth. Obviously, flash forward to today, um, mm-hmm. I'm in, entering my second year of freelance, so I definitely can relate into some of the things you mentioned about you know like gaps in between projects and things that mm-hmm. i guess being like say as routine maybe in a studio and all the other kind of pros and cons that you get with that um mm-hmm. but correct me if i'm wrong but you've kind of always been freelance right yeah 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 yeah, yeah. I've, I've definitely always been uh freelance before my access days as well when i was just a cgi generalist sort of a thing that was always just freelance for me working with you know, small clients, medium clients, not really big clients, uh, <laughs> but uh, that was that was kind of the early life. So I, I kind of grew accustomed to that, and I, I really, you know, I I like that side of the work. Yeah. I I like working from home, uh, uh, but then you know, I, I I like interacting with people as well, and kind yeah, of you yeah. know, working with them on on uh, personal projects. But uh, um, yeah, I, I think in Access, I mean, that's that's I I guess it it might be a misconception, but. Uh, like for example, at Axis, I don't know how it is at the other studios, but um, there's, uh, uh, I would say, I think it's four um, kind of internal, uh, the kind of staff directors, um, who, are, uh, who are some of, some of them are kind of co- co-founders of the company, mm. and they're they're kind of full-time, you know, staff directors. Uh, they they've been there from day one. They built up the company, uh, but then Axis collaborates with. I, I don't know how many at this point, but it's around 10-ish, maybe, uh, kind of offsite directors as well. And those are all freelance. And uh, that makes perfect sense because it's, uh, you know, like many of the freelance directors, they have their own styles and their own expertise and their own, you know, uh, desires. So like, for example, for me, like I'm, I'm not really into stylized projects. Mm-hmm. So it, it doesn't make sense in, in, in a space you know, like if, I, if I'm going to be, you know, full-time director, if a stylized project comes on and nobody else gets to do it, then I have to do it. But that's really not my thing. And it's not really my expertise. And then Axis as a company doesn't get so much value out of me working on it. Um, you know, not to say that I wouldn't be into it, but it's, it's definitely not something that I'm so, you know, drawn to, I guess, mm-hmm. more so than the kind of hyper real realistic side of things. Um, and it's vice versa. You know, there's, there's plenty of directors out there that absolutely adore stylized work and Mm -hmm. they don't want anything to do with, you know, hyper real or photo real um, aspects of the work. So to them, you know, they, they, they just want to be focusing on that. So in in that sense, you know, like access can kind of pick and choose and kind of like when a project comes on board, they'll Mm -hmm. only put, you know, the directors forth that are good, that are a good match for that project. Mm -hmm. Um, So, so it's kind of, it's a, it's a nice balance. It's a nice system. Um, and um, yeah, again, like it's in terms of the work, again, like, you know, being a director, you're not really doing that much hands on work. You're mm. you're attending a lot of meetings at the start, a lot of um, production meetings, a lot of kind of, uh, you know, team briefing meetings and stuff like that uh, at the very start of it. And then it, it just it just becomes, you know, like a re- review session. I mean, I don't want to you know, little it's not really just but it. You know, after a while, it boils down to a review session and looking at dailies. And, uh, you know, you can look at dailies from anywhere. You, you mm. don't have to be necessarily in the room with a person. Like, you can. And it's, I, I think it's definitely beneficial to be in the room because um, sometimes it's just easier to explain things. But if, if these last two years have shown anything, is that you can absolutely 
do this from anywhere. And there's been amazing tools that are kind of developed for this situation specifically that are even more efficient sometimes than being in a room. Mm. Um, like, for example, I mean, we use Shotgun, um, which is now sh called ShotGrid, which is kind of a project management tool. Mm -hmm. And uh, in kind of typical review sessions, I would open up a playlist in Shotgun and I would just kind of, you know, share my screen and then we would talk over whatever's in the playlist for, mm -hmm. for the dailies. But now there's a, there's a new tool that's called SyncSketch. So that allows all of us to be in that same, you know, imagine it like a Photoshop file that's shared for everyone who's in the meeting. And we're all then in there like in a multiplayer game. So we can all see each other's cursors and we can all draw over it, you know? Mm -hmm. So we can all kind of, you know, make annotations and draw over stuff and do paint overs and, you know, uh, it's just, it's just, and the feedback is great. It's very, you know, it's, it's a real time. It's like, it doesn't have any lag like you, like you do when sharing screens. So there's like awesome tools like that, that kind of, you know, um, appeared because of the kind of impo you know, imposing rules of lockdowns and remote work, mm -hmm. uh, that made things actually pretty easier. You know, like I can imagine, you know, going back from lockdown in the office, they'll still, you know, use those same tools in the meeting because they're so good <laughs> about, you know, <laughs> annotating and kind of drawing stuff. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's really, you know, like for, for this specific um, type of work, um, you can very, very much be, you know, it's, ve it's very easy to be remote. Mm -hmm. uh, for the artist side of work, it's a little bit more difficult. It can be easy as well. But uh, like, for example, if you're a concept artist, if you're a designer, uh, you can do, you can work remotely, like no problem. Like that's been done through, you know, many projects before the lockdown even. Um, because your, your work doesn't really rely on the pipeline of the studio, for example, mm -hmm. you know, but when it comes to, you know, asset production, you know, modeling, shading, you know, rendering effects, all of that stuff, like that's very, very dependent on the pipeline. So you can't really use your home workstation for that. You have to use the studio's workstation. So you have to kind of log in remotely and they do have solutions for that that have very low latency, but still it's not the same as being in the studio. Mm -hmm. And then if you run into any technical issues where you need IT support, it's just so much easier to just go over to IT and ask them for mm -hmm. support and help and they'll just you know figure it out instead of you know putting a ticket and just you know twirling your fingers at home without knowing if anything is happening in the studio or not. So it's, it's just um, for those kind of, you know, production side of things related tasks, it's, it's much, much easier and much simpler to just be there. Um, although, yeah, I mean, this new, you know, I think, you know, even, even when this whole situation finishes up, I think hybrid is definitely going to be the, mm -hmm. the, new, the new normal. I think, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's just people who absolutely love to be in a studio and they need to be in the studio to do work. They just mm -hmm. don't have the capacity or kind of the freedom to do it at, ho at home while there's people who maybe wanted to do it at home but couldn't because of the previous kind of misconceptions mm. but now this situation proved that you can so you know a lot of this like companies adopted this kind of hybrid approach that you can work you know when this whole situation you know closes up you can kind of you can choose whether you want to go to the studio, whether you want to work from home, whether you want to mix it up like a week home, a week in the studio, whether you want to you know just feel it out as it goes. So that's I think that's a that's a definitely a positive development because uh, you've had people before maybe who wanted to work from home but couldn't. Uh, now you know it's definitely proven that you can. So uh, so yeah. And from the perspective of a director. Um, obviously myself concept artist and that kind of space of things sometimes much has been made of you know anyone in a particular part of the pipeline um, maybe would like be frustrated at someone else in the pipeline you know sometimes maybe it's the art director I'm not happy with um, something that the artist is doing and vice versa or there's, there's always some kind of gripe about something right um, mm -hmm. like from your perspective um, because <clears throat> you know like as, as you've shown working well within a team and within your pipeline is, is key and making sure that the vision gets across and even just ultimately the job gets it done. Um, mm -hmm. Like from a perspective of a director to say maybe an artist or someone else in the pipeline, like somebody who's maybe either wanting to be a director or maybe somebody who works with directors or just wants to work in that field, maybe starting out like behaviors to adopt and um, nurture before they break into that particular space. Uh, what is key for you um, that people should maybe 
like say core behaviors or just things to keep an eye out for to ensure that whenever they do end up in this space or to improve the space that they're really in to ensure that um, mm -hmm. you're the best asset you can be to the production or just to your team in general? Well, I think it's, um, you know, like all of the, yeah, I guess, uh, let me see if I can phrase this, but uh, I guess like, you know, in every, in, in each department, you know, whether it be characters or, uh, you know, lighting or environments or whatever it is, um, it, it's all artists, you know, it's people who are very, you know, art oriented and very, mm. you know, they, they, they love doing this stuff, you know, even before working in big companies, I would, I would imagine a lot of them, you know, learned on personal projects and, you know, it, it, it's their bread and butter. This is, this is what they love doing. But again, like with, with some of these projects, um, it's like, they they are kind of, the, the artists are kind of, um, um, they, they sometimes don't have necessarily the freedom to explore some of the things that they would like to explore mm -hmm. as if when they were doing personal projects, again, just because of schedules and stuff. So I think like, you know, like the most important thing in a production sense is you, can, you, you have to adhere on whichever level you are, on whichever department you are, you have to adhere to the vision and the, you know, direction of the supervision team. team. So, you know, the direction from the art director, from um, uh, from the director, from the producer, well, the director and the art director really like that. Like we've spent a lot of times talking with clients and talking about the vision of the project and we have it internally nailed down in the in the core team. So now we now our job is to, you know, convey it to the rest of the team so they can execute it. And if if an artist goes rogue and wants to do his own thing, like that can bring value to the project. It, it really can because they, you know uh, the artist can do something that's that's absolutely you know nobody thought of, and we can be all like, oh, that's awesome. Let's you know let's try that. Um, but they, it can also misfire, and it could be something that's completely different. And uh, what it ends up doing is it eats up valuable time uh, mm -hmm. that we often don't have in production. You know, so. I, I would say like one of the one of the key things is like if you want like it's definitely I don't I don't want to you know I think productions can often you know uh, it can stifle the creativity sometimes the artists have uh, because it becomes so very like tight production job that you kind of have to you know adhere to schedules and stuff I think it's very important kind of leaving up the opportunity for people to be creative and being you know like trying out different things uh, but I would say you know n not to you know derail the whole project. The, the the safe way to approach it would be to kind of do the first pass of what was you know requested by kind of the supervision team, and then if there's time remaining, then you can do you know different approaches that you personally would take, mm. and that just you know that has kind of the minimum liability kind of impact on production because we you know the team gets what we need as a base is what was requested and what was briefed, but then if there was time, we get something extra that you know we can kind of you know. That can change maybe how how this process develops really um so i think that's that's probably just maybe the singular thing that i would that i would single out it's it's very difficult though you know like it's very um like a lot of a lot of these kind of high budget productions i think that's kind of the the you know the 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 almost like the what's the what's the expression that i'm looking for um it's it's almost like a contradiction in a way. Like you, you're working on a on a high budget production, but the schedules are very very much planned out ahead of time. So that kind of, you know, being able to explore specific things, uh, you can only explore very early on. Kind of mm. in you know in in two D and concept art and previs and storyboards stuff like that. Like when you go into the actual production of the models and everything, you rarely get the chance. Like you can still explore if you if you budget for it and schedule schedule it. But you rarely get a chance to explore things um, in in those stages, I, I'd say. So it's um, yeah, it's it's a tricky one. It's it's really a tricky one. Um, uh, but yeah, I'd say it's it's um, yeah, uh, adhering to the vision of the core team because it's always, you know, it's the director's, it's the director's vision, and it's the you know, it's the the art director has has his own you know mm. value added to the project and the way he's kind of you know facilitating the director's vision so it's really you know uh, it's really kind of you know staying true to that as as much as possible um so uh, yeah i guess that would be one of the things <laughs> to look out for when you're when you're uh, 
getting into this big, big uh, industry that's uh, that's kind of that that is the entertainment industry. Now that's some very very neat insights. <clears throat> um, two more final, I guess, questions or topics before we wrap this up. Um, the first one is. Again, like I guess this is kind of in between the personal stuff and maybe like the the commercial stuff is mm. some of the collaborations you've done, like with places like Kitbash Three D and Jammer's Big Medium Small. Like mm-hmm. some of the, you know, like I I think yeah, um, the the I guess the different kind of projects you had to do, um, but it's mm. clear that these were still people that you were familiar with. They were exactly like, hey, we want to hire you for this. That you had mm. like a relationship before you kind of work with them, um, mm. and it's also cool to see because. You know, this is like what I personally enjoy to see is because this is like within the ecosystem of the pool of creatives, I guess, that we are that tend to be hired by, you know, mm-hmm. studios and different productions, like amongst that, amongst themselves, they're creating mm-hmm. things in, you know, branching off into different areas as well. Um, Like just, yeah, I'd love to touch upon your experiences doing those kind of things. And did that open that kind of different avenues of creativity that you perhaps didn't expect um, or mm-hmm. vice versa? Oh yeah, I mean it, it's it's definitely been true with you know especially with with uh, JAMA and big medium small recently mm. with the radiation. Um, I mean it's you know it's one of those things. It's it's kind of uh, um, you know like Kitbash 3D is is a, is a, that that promo was a direct result of you know meeting Max at IFCC mm. uh, when we when we did the titles for for the conference in 2017. And you know, just hitting it off with Max and just kind of chatting and chilling in the next few conferences that we kind of met up on, and it was kind of you know, kind of an instant buddies sort of a vibe. Mm. And uh, you know, get, getting to work on that was was really really fun. It was uh, it was just that kind of perfect, you know, in in a similar vein that I kind of like to work, uh, you know, with Milan or is just kind of you know, just let them do their thing because that's what they're good at, and uh, you know. Uh, tried to minimize my feedback <laughs> as much as mm-hmm. I can. It was a similar type of thing here. You know, Max was really into the stuff that I was doing, and he basically just told me that, you know, he needs a promo uh, for Kid Bash. But it was, you know, everything was up to me to just kind mm-hmm. of, you know, decide what I wanted to do in in my style, in my personal style. So um, that was just, you know, complete, you know, free reign to do whatever you want. Uh, but basically, you know, use these resources that we have to to create that. So that was uh, that was a really really nice experience, um, and then with JAMA now recently, like that's that's probably you know one of the best experiences I've had with a personal project. Uh, it's it's sort of I, I still you know I keep calling it a personal project and it really is, mm. uh, but it's it's also you know semi commercial in a sense as well because it is uh, in a way and kind of uh, a, co- a commercial for his assets mm-hmm. uh, you know for for the big medium small assets that's that's really how the whole project started you know like the we were just supposed to do one minute video of a mm. kind of a trailer for for the asset pack and then that one minute trailer you know kind of snowballed into this 10 minute short film mm-hmm. uh and it snowballed into this whole kind of uh, you know something that that shook me to the core in how i approach short films and how mm. i approach creating uh animated short films nowadays and the opportunities that you know unreal engine opened uh is just absolutely staggering for like an independent filmmaker um so i did this this would be as good plug as any like if you're if you're into filmmaking you know look no further than unreal engine or unity what like whatever is the real-time solution for you that works for you it's it's just the the fastest way to learn it's it's absolutely incredible like the the real-time haptic feedback that you get um so it's you know it's it's just uh um yeah, that 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 collaboration with Jama like completely, completely, you know, and it was the same the same deal. It was absolutely the same deal. Like he wanted me to make um, a trailer for his um, for his project, mm-hmm. and then I told him basically that I started to work on it, but um, but I think I can, I'll, I'll be I'll be creating a short film instead. And he said cool, mm-hmm. and then he didn't see anything. And then I just sent him the like you know almost final nine minutes or ten minutes Sick. like version, and he didn't know anything. Like he he knew we recorded some motion capture. He didn't see any work in progress, any mm-hmm. any anything like that. So he just saw you know like the very close to final version, uh, which is you know it's it's an awesome uh, you know way to work <laughs> with people. Nah, it's dope. it's very yeah. similar. It's very it's very similar to IFCC as well in a way. Mm-hmm. You know like I, when we when we've done IFCC, Marco the 
uh, festival organizer for FCC. He never saw it until it went live. Uh, so he just, you know, he he knew that we were making something, but he didn't know what. And then we said we were done and that we we're going to be publishing it today. We just published it and he saw that everyone was sharing it, but he didn't think too much of it, you know? Mm -hmm. And then finally, like two days later, because he was so rushed with organizing the festival, it was just you know, about to start. He finally saw it and it was you know, completely flabbergasted because, again, he was expecting a title sequence and we did like a sh six minute you know, sci-fi short film. Like it's not at all what he expected in a way. Mm. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's stuff like that that I kind of, you know, uh, I really enjoy doing is kind of, you know, just completely taking off, doing my thing and, and very lucky to be in a position where I, I get to work with people like that who mm. you know have their trust uh, in me. Like the, again, similar approach as I, I trust the Milan. I think that's the best, you know, when you, if you want to work with a director and uh, you like that director's work, uh, you, I, I, I don't think you definitely, I don't think you want to, you know, constrain them or mm. impose your vision on them. Like that defeats the whole purpose of it, you know? Um, if, you know, if Jama, for example, or Max started giving me, you know, directing feedback, like that's, that, that defeats the whole purpose of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, like, uh, they're, they're amazing guys to work with and they, they, they know that they know the value of that. So that's why it kind of worked out, I think. Dope. Um, and, um, yeah, speaking of visions, um, like I could literally do a podcast for each single one of your films and just like do a deep dive into all those things. <laughs> but, um, you know, I guess that the final topic I'd love to touch upon. Um, and obviously you'll be definitely going to more depth in the um, CJ filmmaking session. That's mm -hmm. December 18. So yeah, hit the links in the description and get yourself signed up. Um, just a little quick plug on that one as well is the beauty about Learn Squared community is it's worldwide. Um, but at the same time, one thing that isn't cool about worldwide is time zones. Um, but if you <laughs> do have a ticket, um, but you can't make it, I think it's 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. Um, and it should be no later than 1 p.m. Pacific time. Um, is that once you have a ticket, that's the lowest price it will be. Um, but you still have access to the event if you can't make it. So, you know, that's still going to be, be there for you. You don't necessarily have to only see it. Although if you can make it, that'd be, the, that'd be perfect as well. But you can still have access to that um, once the event has ended. Almost, I think, a few hours after it's ended as well. Um, but yeah, yeah your, your project. So, like, vision. Um, one thing. Um, and obviously you kind of explained it within the conversations I've had today as well is like one thing I've noticed in all of your projects um, and more specifically your personal ones is like there's like like you mentioned like there's um, I think in some of your process as well like you mentioned like you, you do have certain things um, and you kind of mentioned this in, in the what in real offers as well is that you can focus more on okay having this angle would that provoke the viewer more so like you are kind of like trying to ask questions of the viewer or maybe of a philosophy or point you're trying to make, you know, all those kind of things that, mm -hmm. that, that you can weave in, like either the psychological things that end up in films and artistry in general. Um, mm -hmm. But one thing I like to see, it was almost in every single one, there's like a shot where there's, it's always very character driven. And there's always like a focal point, whether it's a, you know, in Bounty Hunt, it's, it's, a, it's a killer robot. Um, mm -hmm. Or like, you know, you've got characters like in Frey or even, you know, like um, through the perspective of of the the girl in in um Berlin the the playgrounds one mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. like there's always that one shot where either it's something like a huge epic piece of architecture or a structure or something that's that is just mm -hmm. way bigger than the the mm -hmm. the the character themselves so obviously you mentioned you you've dabbled in um or worked a lot in arch architectural visualization early mm -hmm. on and still do so you can clearly see um that like you know that DNA is still there and me and my brother once were talking about again, Denny Villeneuve, and like he uses architecture a lot in all of his films, um, mm -hmm. from what I understand. Like, um, I haven't seen his, his super first one, but like any, anything since um, mm -hmm. Enemy and Beyond and even obviously um, Prisoners, like there's always something um, architecturally related that plays mm -hmm. into the story or even a backdrop. And I can see that in, in yourself too. Um, and even like, you know, flashing forward to irradiation like those spoilers if you haven't seen it but um <laughs> again whenever that kind of like switch to wherever that that switch in dimensional realm whatever it is and those you mm -hmm. know like derelict structures that abstract monolithic thing that mm -hmm. is there that's very menacing you know it's yeah. like that's one thing i've picked up on but like 
do you have a particular vision when you come to make these things? Like, is there something that, you know, like that, you know, is your style and you always want to make sure is in there. And I'm sure that's quite a heavy topic to end on. No, 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 no. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely, I mean, you know, in, in terms of vision, like there's always, there, there's always, you know, it need, you need to have a vision of what the film is going to be before, you know, even, you know, before you put words on a page, really, like you need to know what the story is and you mm -hmm. need to know, how you intend to tell this story like what's the you know vision really pertains to um you know like the 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 general what the story is about mm -hmm. uh what's the mood of the film what's the kind of the tone of it uh, what's the pace of it uh what's the look of it what's the kind of the emotional intent behind it um and uh that, that's the kind of like the broad strokes of of how you envision you know uh, this this film to be um when it comes to you know those specific shots i mean those those are you can kind of uh it's 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 just one of the kind of many personal favorite shots that i that i personally like to do you know mm -hmm. i i like silhouettes i like mm -hmm. you know big foggy landscapes and um you know super you know extreme wide shots um compositionally speaking um you know, small characters against uh, a big object like that's that's kind of the personal uh, kind of taste uh, of mm. specific shots that I like. But it's not just you know those shots are never there just to tick that box mm. of kind of oh I need to have this shot in there because I like it. Uh, those shots are all, only there to support the story. You know, mm. so it's it's always uh, you know like if it's if it's a centered frame you know waist down cut off little girl in a eastern european you know uh brutalist building block mm -hmm. with an empty playground uh against all these empty buildings and empty playgrounds is to you know signify how small she is, mm -hmm. is against this whole uh world and how insignificant and alone she feels uh, amidst the bombing you know mm -hmm. um or if it's you know the floating you know rbmk core uh graphite block over mm -hmm. Yevgeny and his vision in irradiation it's to exemplify, you know, his growing fear of uh, irradiation that's kind of present all throughout the piece that only gets stronger and stronger. And, uh, you know, he fears the, you know, irradiated graphite blocks all throughout the film. Um, in that point of the vision, one giant one is just floating over his head. It's, it's kind of, um, uh, mm. it's, very direct, it's very directly connected to the story. And, you know, that moment isn't just... Uh, Th that that's why like you know like some of those things like for example like that specific moment from irradiation that was written in the script like uh, specifically what what happens and what kind of image i had in mind for for that moment it's not something you you kind of accidentally discover along the way and be like oh yeah i can maybe you know scale up this giant rock here and just mm. place it there and it'll look cool it's it's something that's very very integral to the story um because that fear kind of constantly grows and um, that's one way to you know uh, exemplify it by showing how small he is against that and the fact that he might be crushed by the weight of it and, or just by the weight of that fear really now i'm explaining too much about the film which i don't want to do mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's you know it's it's always stuff like that you know like uh, or you know the in freight where you have you know the character at the end silhouetted by the wall of red gl red glowing uh machines mm -hmm. seeking for more you know stuff <laughs> whatever he, whatever he's carrying um you know it's it's always do it's it's not just as a as a box ticking exercise of oh this is a shot that i like so i have to put it in there mm -hmm. it's it, it has to connect to the story and it has to exemplify a moment in the story or the emotion that we that the audience needs to feel in that in that moment so it's it's really it's really you know down to kind of cinematography really and kind of how you you know you have that moment and how are you going to shoot that moment? So, for example, in Freight, you know, like that moment, that was written in the story, like the, in the script. Uh, basically, the fact that he gets at, gets at the, 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 the giant wall at the end, the, you know, the wall collapses, a bunch of machines come out, and, uh, you know, the character collapses under the weight of, of, of all this pressure being mm -hmm. added. Um, but that was, you know, it wasn't written, you never write in your scripts, you know, center frame composition far mm. away, <laughs> you, you don't write that stuff. Um, so, so there's this moment that's been written in the story. So, you know, I'm going to read that and you're going to read that. And, you know, five other people are going to read that and everyone's going to have their own vision of how they're mm. going to shoot that. You know, everyone's going to have an idea for a shot that's completely different. 
and not to say that you know this is right this is just my way of doing it it's you know you have completely valid ways of doing it differently to still retain the the impact of of that of the character feeling small and insignificant against this this kind of you know building of the pressure uh, above him but um um you know there's there's plenty of different ways that you can do that uh, there there are wrong ways that you can do that as well mm-hmm. that don't convey the emotion very well but there's definitely plenty of other right ways to do it as well so it just it just depends on your own that 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 really goes a little bit more in the cinematography side of things rather than the vision side of things because mm-hmm. the vision the vision side of things really it, it has to do with the overall mood you know mm. like the story of freight you know it needs to be very somber very mm. you know slow paced very dark and very depressing um so that's my vision for the project you know it's not you know a happy story about an alien an alien delivering <laughs> a glowing orb and then he goes back to his family um and kind of you know the slapstick humor along the way that's a different vision for the same story mm. you know <laughs> so so that's the that's the two differences i think is kind of you know your your vision is really what what sets the mood and sets the kind of the broad strokes of what this film is to you um but then like all those shot specific choices those get added a little bit later along the way once you do the storyboards or the previs or even like now in unreal where you actually do the 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 final production Mm -hmm. like your first pass is your kind of final pass almost Mm -hmm. uh where you get to really kind of you know utilize the advantages of real-time rendering and to kind of to to the advantages of cinematography and um yeah it's 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 a whole different topic that cinematography bit like i'm a Mm -hmm. i'm a huge fan of it it's it's one of my favorite you know apart from directing it's one of my favorite aspects of filmmaking is cinematography Mm -hmm. i absolutely love it and the fact that I can do it now reactively in Unreal is just absolutely liberating and amazing on so many levels. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Now, dude, that's that's well put. And like, I have a thousand more questions for you, but that's a testament to the great work you do, and obviously the work you put into your stuff, and how awesome it is, and how much it resonates. Not just with myself, I'm sure that's for many members of the audience and beyond as well. Um, so, yeah, thank you for joining me today and giving your time and dropping your wisdom. And yeah, look, cheers, Aaron. I, I enjoyed it very much, man. It was it was awesome to catch up as well. And, and definitely, um, yeah, I hope this is this is helpful to to anyone out there uh, wanting to embark on this journey. Yeah, for sure. And the, um, if you're looking for more, just grab your ticket. Um, the links are below. Um, but yeah, grab your ticket, December the 18th, and just listen to Sava's wisdom on CJ filmmaking. Um, thank you, Sava, and we'll do this again soon. Cheers, Aaron. Thanks. Dude, that is done. That was sick, man. Thank you so much. A massive thanks to Sava for dropping that wisdom and being transparent on his process. Get your ticket to his session with us this Saturday on December the 18th by hitting the links in this episode description. Remember, if you have a ticket but can't make it, you will still have access to a recording of the session forever. And of course, please check out Sava's amazing work via the links below too. I've been your host, Aaron Danda. Till next time.